the displacement was about a foot each direction. And by that time, the mock-ups that, that simulated the floor framing system were just splintering and disintegrating. The structural fuses did not fail. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Engineer Thor Madison, a structural engineer in the Bay Area of California working on seismic retrofits. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Thor, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been following your work for uh, as long as I've been in this business. Can you tell me how you became an engineer, if you wouldn't mind? Well, I started out uh, as a carpenter. Uh, I love to build things, love doing stuff outside, doing construction work. And I was up on a roof, uh, an apartment building roof. Uh, my, my supervisor and I had 180 sheets of plywood to lay down and, and install. And it was fun for about the first 15. And then it just got to be kind of work. And, um, and to top it off, that, that day, um, it was in October when California often gets a hot spell. And it was about 105. Oh, we went through a five-gallon igloo uh, container of Kool-Aid. And, uh, and our boss brought a, a four or six packs of Pepsi for us. It's a good strategy to keep your, your crew caffeinated. Um, so we finished that. Uh, there were three of us. So split five gallons uh, of Kool-Aid, uh, <laughs> a case of Coke. And I went home for dinner and um, had a half gallon of pineapple sherbet for dinner. And I thought, you know, maybe it's time to dust off the college application. And because and, I don't think I want to be doing this when I'm 50. And so I went back to, to Cal Poly and, and got my degree in engineering. And then when I turned 50, I actually was crawling underneath houses, looking at how to strengthen them and keep them from falling down in the next earthquake. So your love of building is what... Uh pushed you into the engineering field? Is that a fair ass assessment? Yeah. Um, solving, you know, solving problems, how to make connections uh, in a structure and, and how to, you know, follow, follow where the, the strength needs to be and make sure it's, it's there. And how did the uh, specialty in seismic retrofits come about? Uh, well, that was with the Previous economic downturn, um, I got a call from a contractor in the Bay Area. I was actually living up in the Sierra foothills at the time. Um, and this contractor had read my book on shear wall construction. And he had some questions and called me um, after hours and said, hey, you should come to the Bay Area. We got a bunch of seismic retrofits that are going on and we need you down here. So I, I followed the money, uh, such as it was. And really enjoy working on old houses that uh, were put together with hand tools and just admiring the the craftsmanship that went into those those houses and trying to keep them standing after the next earthquake um, just sort of became a, a pet project and a, a mission to that seemed like it, it needed somebody focusing on it. Is it uh hundreds or dozens of product uh, projects by this point on, of these uh we'll talk more about what a soft story retrofit is in a minute but how many of these have you done now um it's got to be in the hundreds you know not not a thousand but well into the hundreds of projects so uh your primary uh mission is to protect these buildings uh which have soft stories can you can you tell us what what that is and what's the problem uh structurally sure a soft story uh means different things to um private home inspectors and real estate agents and um and engineers so the technical definition of a soft story is any story in a building that has less than 70% of the stiffness of the story above. So right there, it means that you need to have at least a two-story building. Um, you could also consider that a story might be the crawl space level. So um, typically, the 
crawl space walls of, of a house are going to be less than 70% as stiff as the main level walls above. And that's not what, um, what the home buyers and the real estate agents and the home inspectors think of. They usually think of a garage door opening because that's sort of typically what we see is the weakness in, in a house that will sort of draw attention to a, a, a soft story condition. So these buildings just don't have enough shear resistance to uh, withstand a sh good shake. Is that correct? That's that's true. And and strength and stiffness are are different properties of a building. They're very similar. Uh, the the problem with the soft story and and it involves stiffness. It's divine, defined on the basis of of stiffness. And so if you think of um, of something that's going to absorb energy. Like if you have a stack of, of take a bunch of sponges and freeze them. So then you stack them up to create a, a you know, maybe a five level building of sponges, frozen sponges. Now you take, you, you shake that back and forth. That's a fairly rigid structure. Now you take the bottom sponge and you thaw it out. So it's just a, a wet sponge. Now, if you shake that, that structure again, all the deformation is going to occur in that bottom sponge. And so it's kind of focusing the energy of the earthquake on that lower level. And so the same thing can happen in a soft story building where you, you might have four or five levels above the, the soft story that could absorb energy energy from the earthquake and help dissipate the earthquake energy. But because they're on top of this really soft, squishy level, they're really not going to absorb en any energy until the soft story fails, basically. So, so it, it kind of focuses the earthquake energy into one level rather than distributing it throughout the various levels of the building. Mm. So what are the various techniques to reinforce these structures to prevent them from coming down in a big earthquake? If you're looking at, at a, a regularly shaped uh, plain old house above a crawl space, you want to reinforce the crawl space walls with plywood, typically. So that's going to be nailing up plywood on the interior of the, of the crawl space walls. And that, that might sound very simple at first, but I wrote a... a 350 page book on how to do that so it's more than and a fine home building article i might add <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um it's more than just oh you go in and, and you install plywood you got to pay attention to all the the different framing conditions that you might find so that's the that's how you might address it in a just a, a crawl space um underneath a, a one or two or maybe three-story building if you've got a garage um Typically, the reason the soft story is there is because the doors in the garage wall are giant holes in the structure, basically. So you really only have a couple of narrow walls on either side of the garage door, and that's where you can put your strengthening elements. So the, the kind of classic approach to that is to install a welded steel frame you we have call a it a moment frame, right? Am I right about that? Yes. Yeah. Moment, moment resisting frame is uh, the technical term for those. And those, um, they're hard to fit into an existing building. So often you need to move the um, electric meter or the gas meter that's also right inside the garage door. Um, there might be water services that are in the way, dryer ducts, all the things that people have installed in their house in the last 80 or 100 years that are now in the way and might cost as much as the retrofit, it, the, the retrofit work itself to move before you can actually start the structural reinforcement process. And uh, to that end, you came up with, and can you first tell me the specific product and then the style of uh, structural element that it could be considered with, if you could? Sure. It's, um, it's called the skinny brace, and you see the, the label on one of them right up here. 
We should um, tell folks who are listening that uh, Thor has a bunch of them behind him in his uh, backdrop, right? Yeah. So, um, and it it actually doesn't fit into any uh, of the pigeonholes that engineers have for structural elements. It's it's a steel column, but it's got a specially engineered uh, structural fuse, is is the term for it. And it's just like an electrical fuse where the fuse itself is meant to fail before the rest of the structural system. So, so the, the yellow part, this, this thing that looks sort of like an ore um, that's at the top of the column, that's where, where all the seismic energy is focused and dissipated during an earthquake. Is it and a special so, steel, Thor? I mean, is it, what is it? It's a special <laughs> shape. So, uh-huh. so to put it simply, I patented a parabola. Um, <laughs> however, it's, it's joined up with some, some special connections and it's, uh, it's designed to, um, to fail before anything else in the structural system does. So during the earthquake, that part absorbs the energy in a very efficient and predictable uh, manner. So because of that, we can we can apply sort of a, a, a better safety factor to the entire system as it's designed. So uh, just a plain old cantilever column that might be another solution to strengthening the soft story, that would need to be designed with a very high safety factor because it's really not very reliable. And so that is a very inefficient system. It needs more concrete for the foundation, all the other uh, connections throughout the, the, the seismic retrofit project need to be stronger. Um, and so my design allows you to use smaller members, uh, a smaller foundation. Um, and we, just- we should tell folks that these rely on a big hunk of con- reinforced concrete in the, in, uh, below the uh, slab uh, in, I, in the one installations I've seen where in garages. And I, I'm guessing that provides enough mass that the column uh, doesn't move. Is that correct? Correct. And I should point out that almost any retrofit for a soft story building is going to need a new foundation because you can't take uh, an 80 or 100 year old foundation and expect it to support the earthquake forces that were not even understood back when it was built. So that the, the new foundation is really a factor in almost any soft story retrofit. So you asked about the steel, um, and there's, it's not really a special steel. It's mostly the shape of the steel that provides the ductility that's needed and the, the strength, dis, um, the, the energy dis, dissipation um, qualities that we're after. You told me in a previous conversation that... Uh... Anytime one of these systems goes through a big earthquake, they are consumed. They're con- it's a consumable thing, right? You have to replace it, but that's another advantage of the fuse, correct? Yes. In general, um, almost any, any uh, seismic force resisting system, whether it's plywood shear walls or the, the moment resisting frame or a concrete or masonry structure, um, that's basically going to be trash after the earthquake, the maximum considered earthquake that it was designed for. And uh, this kind of surprises a lot of people that why do we have it this? It surprised me, moment? yeah. And it's actually um, under consideration right now at the, the federal level, the National Institute of Standards and Technology is looking into this and, and trying to um, kind of update our code so that after a hurricane or an earthquake or now wildfires, we're not looking at rebuilding entire communities because that, that's really pretty disruptive to our mm-hmm. way of life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm sure these projects are expensive, whether you're using your system or others. Uh, and my observation is that homeowners seldom want to spend money on things that uh, don't improve their comfort or their aesthetics of their home. Uh, 
Is, is that true of this? Do, do people, uh, clients call you and say, I want to uh, make my house more resistant to earthquake forces. Can you help me? Or is it some other thing at work here? Um, there are enough home buyers and owners that understand that um, continental drift is still occurring, that they, sh they want to reinforce their house. And so that gave me uh, more business than I could handle for the last um, 10 or 15 years. Um, but certainly there, there's probably the far greater uh, percentage of homeowners that they want the granite countertops and they don't want to install anything to support those. So um, it's, it's a challenge to get people to, to make their homes safer and more resilient. Um, can, can I assume that a modern home inspection in California looks at the uh, uh, earthquake resistance of, of a home as part of the evaluation? The, um, I've, I've been a member of the American Society of Home Inspectors since about 2010, and their members in the Bay Area are quite aware of earthquakes and the hazards involved and the weaknesses uh, that they, they typically come across. Um, I don't actually know if there are state requirements to, to mention earthquakes. Um, the real estate agents themselves, uh, sometimes would rather downplay the hazards of a building because they or talk about it. At, they don't want to talk about it at all. They don't want anyone to think bad about any house. Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> well, and there, there, are, uh, quite a few myths that, that get spread around, um, you know, that, oh, this, this, this house made it through the 1989 earthquake. And it's, well, great. If you, if that house was actually in downtown Santa Cruz and you brought it to Oakland 60 miles away, then I might think that that, that gives it some credibility, but the shaking from an earthquake in the, in the Bay area from an actual Bay area fault will be about 20 times greater than it was from that earthquake in 1989. So they're, but these are, they're myths that, that uh, are floating around and, and will keep floating around probably until the next big earthquake that we get locally. Uh, as we talked about earlier, I know you used to be a proponent of plywood shear walls. In fact, you did the FHB article I mentioned, which we'll link on the podcast uh, page for those of you listening. Uh, why did you move away from the plywood uh, shear walls and develop the skinny brace? So um, plywood shear walls are still great when they work, uh, but to get one to, to reinforce a soft story building uh, with plywood shear walls only, you would basically have to cover up the garage door opening, uh, frame that in and install plywood across the width of the, the front wall of the garage. So I was looking for something that was actually a practical solution and would not uh, have to reduce the garage door opening, um, would be as flexible and resilient as plywood shear walls that are typically used in the rest of the, the, of the retrofit of a building. So, you know, you, you might put one of my products at the front wall of the garage and use plywood on the other three walls uh, to, to strengthen it. So um, they're, they're meant to act more or less together and compatibly, which is not the same as all retrofit elements would. So you could, you could put a, a steel moment frame into a garage with plywood shear walls but because of the properties of a typical welded steel frame, those plywood shear walls would need to be about 40% stronger than they need to be if they're working together with a skinny brace. So you told me uh, when we spoke in a previous conversation that all of these uh, solutions for this soft story problem rely on steel in some fashion. And uh, can you, that was also uh, very surprising to me. Can you explain that, please? Sure. Um, and I should say, I sh engineers and scientists never like to say 100%. Um, <laughs> oh, sure. Because <laughs> there, are, 
there are earthquake retrofit methods and systems that rely on giant shock absorbers and stuff like that, where you've got fluids that are um, going through orifices to, to absorb the energy. So discounting those, just about any structural system that's used uh, relies on steel to dissipate the energy. So in a welded steel frame, it's going to be the beams that are flexing and deforming, uh, and, and that absorbs the energy. In a, a plywood shear wall, you might have hundreds or even thousands of nails that are bending back and forth. And when you add those up, uh, all those nails can absorb a whole bunch of energy, um, and, and that's what, what protects your house. Uh, the same thing with concrete and masonry. You've got steel reinforcing bars that are going to be stretching and, and absorbing the earthquake energy. And most of those are going to get ruined as they absorb the earthquake energy. So, and in my system, uh, the structural fuse itself does get um, deformed and needs to be replaced. But that can be done by removing five or six bolts and putting new structural fuses in place. Uh, there's one competitor that has a structural fuse system, but to replace their structural fuses, you need to replace, remove and replace either 40 to 48 bolts. So it's a much, much more difficult process. We'll be back with more right after this. If you run a home service business like painting, contracting, lawn care, cleaning, your to-do list is endless. From hiring staff to mountains of paperwork, not to mention doing the actual work that pays the bills. Jobber is a mobile and online app that helps you organize your business and look professional. With Jobber, you can quote jobs, schedule your crew, invoice, and get paid all in one place. Try it free today at getjobber.com slash finehomebuilding. So uh, the, the big question is, like, have any of the skinny braces gone through a big shake yet? And, like, how do you get approval for this? Like, how do you test it? It seems, like, un unsolvable. So um, in, in the 1990s, they wanted to develop methods to test plywood shear walls. And so um, there was a, a bunch of research done, and they came up with a, a standard method for testing plywood shear walls. And since I wanted my, my system to work along with plywood shear walls, I thought, okay, this is the, the testing method that I'll use. And so that involved full-scale tests at the UC Berkeley Laboratory, which is this huge building where they've got some pretty immense, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment there to test things. It's a big shaker table? They, they have a big shake table. That's not actually what we used. Uh, they use that for testing, you know, electrical transformers and other, other things. Um, so cool. But our system relied on these enormous hydraulic rams that, that pushed the specimen back and forth. Um, and I think up until the displacement was about a foot each direction. And by that time, the mock-ups that, that simulated the floor framing system were just splintering and disintegrating. The structural fuses did not fail um, before, well, I, I should say they, they didn't break or fracture uh, before enough force was exerted that in, in the real world, the entire building would have been a heap of rubble at the time that the structural fuses failed. So what, uh, what shake, what's, uh, earthquake, uh, intensity are you trying to design for? I mean, can you design for the really big one that's inevitable for the Bay area? Uh, what the, at the time, the engineers are set loose with the numbers and the, the geologic properties and stuff. We are not actually looking at like a, an 8.2 magnitude earthquake or a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. We're just looking at what geologists and seismologists believe would be the strongest shaking level 
at that building location. So I don't, I don't go into the code and say, okay, I need to resist a, a magnitude 6.8 earthquake. I go into the code and say, this is my location. Uh, what, what is the acceleration of the ground that I need to be designing for? So the maximum design in the Central Valley of California is going to be a lot smaller than the the, or I'm, I'm sorry, the maximum earthquake in the Central Valley will be a lot less intense than the maximum earthquake in the Bay Area or the, the Los Angeles area, or actually and that's Eastern California. Based on the proximity to the fault line, correct? Right. And also the soil type. And, um, and it, it also depends on the type of the building. So um, if, if you've got a, a tall building, it's going to behave a lot differently than a, a short squat bunker type structure. And I presume masonry buildings are less resistant to a shake than a light wood frame building too, right? Well, if you're building a new structure, um, it's my job to make sure it's just as, as capable of resisting earthquake forces, whether it's masonry or wood or straw bale or steel framed. So, so we, we give you a building that will be strong enough. Um, on a completely un, uh, unrelated note, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Millennium Tower, but you bowed out ahead of the show. <laughs> but you did confide uh, an interest in this building that's sinking in the Bay Area. And uh, uh, yeah, so maybe someone else who listens to Pro Talk will weigh in on that, Thor. <laughs> <laughs> that's... Uh... That's a little out of the fine home building scope. Of this, so I think <laughs> you're not usually aimed at, at uh, designers and builders of 50 story concrete buildings. I, it's fascinating to me. I'm sure you can imagine, right? Uh, buildings in this country aren't supposed to sink into the ground that cost uh, gazillions of dollars, right? One would hope. <laughs> So what do you like about being an engineer? I've seen photos of you on your website, crawling around dusty crawl spaces. Uh, what's cool about it? Um, I really do love seeing the different construction methods that were used, you know, the turn of the previous century, um, the different joinery methods, some of which didn't really consider gravity and the, uh, the strength of wood um, in their design, but are nonetheless uh, well-made and clever. Um, some of those need to be supplemented, uh, but it, it really is just fascinating to me. And, and, and uh, trying to figure out how a house may have been remodeled over the years and where they filled in openings and put in new beams and expanded rooms and stuff. Uh, there's just fascinating stuff buried behind the walls of a lot of Do these. you find it's normally done badly or is it normally structurally sound? Um, most of the time, it's structurally sound as far as carrying the weight of the structure. The gravity above. loads, yeah. But um, figuring out how to resist earthquake forces, it's really tricky. And, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I still get my mind twisted around sometimes when I'm trying to figure out how to resist earthquake forces that need to go around corners horizontally or or things like that. So builders and, and engineers are, are equally challenged in getting all the seismic detailing correct. What uh, would you rather not have to do with, with being an engineer? I mean, you're a business owner too, so there's, I'm sure you're wearing a lot of hats. Well, um, the engineering is often very easy compared to the politics. Um, we're, we're, this current product is, uh, it's been approved, I should, approved is not, not the proper term. It's been evaluated by an independent evaluation agency, which is one of many such agencies that can provide evaluations. They're all created equal. They all follow the same guidelines. Uh, the International Standards Organization has set those out. Those are internationally recognized. And yet some building departments are stuck decades ago when there was 
only one or two evaluation agencies that they know and trust. And so getting our lesser known evaluation agency through those building departments has proven difficult. It's, it's sort of like saying, okay, you need to have a licensed electrician install your electrical panel but their company name can only begin with A through J. And I'm sure the challenge for you is like this testing, I'm sure is expensive. You can't just go to a number of uh, labs and, and, and have this stuff evaluated. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I never actually added up how much it costs to do the testing. Um, the time developing the, the test models and the jigs that were needed to hold them in place that was probably actually more than the testing cost itself, but we're, you know, you're probably looking at two hundred thousand dollars to get the very basic testing done for a product like this. Wow. What about the uh, end result? Do folks uh, like send you emails and say, you know, this was way less painful than I thought it might be? Uh, you know, I didn't have to lose as much space in my garage, or did they say I opened my car door into a skinny brace and I don't like it anymore? Um, I've gotten I've gotten zero complaints. Um, one client didn't like the color. <laughs> um, and I asked, I said, okay, maybe it's uh, because these colors remind you of UC Berkeley, which is not actually why I chose them. <laughs> anyway, maybe he was a Stanford grad. Um, uh, most, mostly the reaction has been very positive because they know what the alternatives are and um, the alternatives are really pretty poor. You'd need to either shrink the size of your garage door or move electrical equipment to one side uh, to one side of the garage or the other and it's just it's uh, my my system is much less disruptive than most of the others so this is my favorite part of the show uh can you please tell me about your own house do you have any seismically risky assemblies <laughs> on it <laughs> I hope I have fewer than when I bought the house. <laughs> uh, I I still have a masonry chimney, which um, and my house is is it's not as old as I am, so that chimney is probably in better shape than most chimneys. Um, the chimney really is about the most dangerous thing that you can have in a house. Um, they, they cause most of the deaths in earthquakes. I did not know that. It's because they're unreinforced and skinny, right? Yeah. And they, yeah. they just topple. And um, they're heavy. That, that nice, <laughs> massive fireplace that you see that just looks huge and stout, that often is just a, a single layer of bricks that can fall off very easily. And those the, the mortar has been aging and getting weaker and weaker and weaker over the decades. And, um, you know, I see chimneys that, that you can scrape out the mortar with your finger. And some of that mortar has been taken away by ants or something. It's just, it's really scary. Um, my chimney is not that bad. It doesn't go very high above the roof. It's surrounded on four sides by the house. And um, I want to take it down eventually, but mostly because of the hassle of re-roofing around it. And uh, you can't really can't be burning wood most of the time because of air quality issues. So what's the point of having a fireplace? Um, like you said, it's a hole in your roof, right? Yeah. Um, other than that, I've, I've done a fair amount of strengthening, bolting the mud sills to the, the foundation walls and adding plywood here and there and strengthening the roof connections and, you know, things that an engineer with tools might undertake. The um, bolting your mud sill down, uh, I'm assuming that's done with epoxy anchors or some other kind of chemical uh, anchoring system, correct? Um, I used expansion anchors because uh -huh. I know how not to install them wrong. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you just need to make sure that they're far enough from the edge of the concrete and don't over tighten them to the point that they start cracking the concrete, which is 
actually pretty hard to do. It's possible to do, but it it does, you know, you really have to kind of overdo the wrenching of that that anchor to make the concrete. So that's common that's why more commonly um epoxy or uh acrylic anchoring systems are specified because people don't know how to do the wedge anchors. Well, um and the these products have to undergo the independent evaluation just like uh, my skinny brace did. And when they do that, um, engineers discovered that concrete cracks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like we didn't know that, but at, at some point they decided that, well, we need to, to check and make sure that the anchors are going to work in cracked concrete. So getting an anchor to work in cracked concrete is easier when it's an adhesive type anchor than when it's an expansion anchor. So uh, whether that is really valid in uh, the application that, that most of the mud seal bolting is used for, you know, you could argue that maybe it doesn't matter because you're just trying to keep the mud seal from sliding on top of the, the, foundation wall, but that's not my call. So, uh, do you like working on your house? You mentioned that you did like being a carpenter for a while, but oftentimes it's just an impossible amount of work. What, what's it like working on your house for you? Uh, so I, I'm sort of a chronic remodeler. Um, I love doing stuff. I, I kind of hate doing stuff over that should have been done better in the first place. Uh, but when I, you know, when I do a project, I try to make it so it's, it's the last time that that particular element or feature has to be addressed. And do you have a good collection of tools? Do you like tools and, and, uh, working on the, the house? I've got far too many tools and <laughs> I've got duplicates because when I need something at the shop and it's, it's at home or maybe stored away because I've been focusing so much of my time on the business lately. I just, it's like, okay, I need another Sawzall. So <laughs> I get one. It's fantastic. So uh, what's the website for starters? Uh, Quakebracing.com is the, the current website where you can find out more about the skinny braces and- uh, um, And your services. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm actually no longer um, trying to promote myself as doing the earthquake retrofit engineering work because I need to focus on building up the business and, and selling these nifty steel things. Well, I hope everyone buys one because they are good looking. And I do <laughs> like the blue and yellow. Um, anything you want to ask or tell our listeners? It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, yeah. Uh, the biggest thing is earthquakes i mean most most people they're thinking about their own house during an earthquake as being the one house that they really care about whether it gets damaged or not and if they they say they're postponing doing retrofit work or they're thinking oh i i i think i'll just get earthquake insurance and if something happens i can rebuild my house the absolute worst construction that I've encountered in my, my work as an engineer has been after a natural disaster. So primarily wildfires, because those are what have destroyed, you know, up to 3,000 homes at a time in, in the Bay Area. When those houses get rebuilt, you've got everybody with a tool belt that's west of the Mississippi flocks out to California they're in a rush to finish the project. The plans that they're following were done by an architect or an engineer who was in a rush to get the plans done and submitted. The inspections are being done by inspectors who are overworked and- Because um, there's so much work, right? There's just too much to do. Yeah, and it's horrible. And if you think that your house is going to get rebuilt, even if you get paid enough insurance money it, it could get rebuilt, but it's definitely not going to be the quality that you would want. So earthquake insurance is a really bad secondary option to actually doing the work that will keep your house standing during an earthquake. 
so that if there's some, you know, some damage, maybe there's some doors that you have to plane down or something, there's cracked plaster, you can get that taken care of in a different time frame than if your house is completely flattened and you need to get it rebuilt so you can you have a place to live. That is an excellent point that and one I had never considered. Well, Thor, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, it's been great to talk with you and um, appreciate your having me on. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Strengthen your house from seismic events. (laughs) 